Welcome. I am so excited that you're here. Uh, my name is Brittany Shanahan, and I am the Medicare for All organizer at Public Citizens uh, Medicare for All campaign. I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight to, Flor to the Florida Medicare for All Town Hall, co-led by Medicare for All Florida. I also wanna thank all of the organizations that co-sponsored this event tonight. So what we're doing with this town hall is trying to create a platform for a stronger movement for Medicare for All in Florida to forge relationships between groups that may not have even met before and to really build for the future. So I'm just gonna share my screen so people can see how many co-sponsored. Um, da, da, da. Mm. So it's a lot. <laughs> Hopefully you all can see that uh, because I have to now read them out. I don't know if you ever listened to the uh, Chemical Elements song, but I'm going to try and channel my inner Tom Lehrer because it is really great. The 60, we've got over 60 co-sponsoring organizations. I know I'm going to leave some out here. Um, hopefully Stefan can like add them to anyone that I've forgotten. Um, this is like the most I've ever gotten for any, any Medicare for All webinar. And I've been doing these webinars for four years, let alone for a single state. So here we go. Medicare for All Florida, Public Citizen, Medicare for All Resolutions, Labor Campaign for Single Payer, National Nurses United, National Union of Healthcare Workers, Physicians for a National Health Program, American Medical Student Association, Committee of Interns and Residents, SCIU Healthcare, National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association, Florida Alliance of Retired Americans, United Faculty of Florida, CWA Board of Presidents, uh, Washington Baltimore News Guild, uh, local. Uh, Central Florida AFL-CIO, South Florida AFL-CIO, Broward AFL-CIO, Alachua County Labor Coalition, Labor Community Alliance of South Florida, Dade County Street Response, Florida Access Network, National Organization for Women, Miami Chapter, Bands of Miami, the Umbrella Brigade, Miami Coalition to Advance Racial Equity, Sunrise Movement Orlando Chapter, Democratic Haitian American Cross Coast of Florida, Progressive Democrats of America, PDA Florida, PDA Central Florida, Democratic Progressive Caucus of Florida, Progressives for Demo Democracy in America, Florida, Democratic Progressive Caucus of Florida, DFA Palm Beach County, Dedicated Dems of Homestead in Florida City, Young Democrats of Orange County, Osceola Young Democrats, Polk Young Democrats, young University of Florida College Democrats, Almost Done, Democratic Women's Club of Titusville, Blue Wave Coalition, Orange County Democratic Party, Sem Dems, Northwest Coalition, Lucia Democratic Clubs, Rainbow Sendems, Pride at Work, Come Out with Pride Orlando, Sisters Lead Sisters Vote, Polk DSA, Space Coast DSA, Somos Loud, League of United Amer Latin American City Citizens, LULAC Florida Chapter, Al Alianza, La Mesa Borcua de Florida, Hablamos Español, Florida, Poder Latinx, Florida Rising, Florida Immigrant Coalition, Hope Community Center, Rising Against All Odds, Standing Heroes for Average Workers, Left to Center, Organizing to Victory, Central Florida Jobs with Justice, Students for a National Health Program, FCFG Chapter, Citizens for a National Health Program, UM Chapter, uh, Physicians for a National, National Health Program, Social Security Works, One Pair of States, Healthcare Now, and more. All right. <laughs> so there, uh, there we go. Um, let me just keep moving. Um, so, uh, we're honored that we will have with us tonight U.S. Representative Maxwell Frost of Florida's 10th Congressional District. Representative Frost is an enthusiastic co-sponsor of H.R. 3421, the Medicare for All Act in the House. We'll also hear from community leaders in the fight for health justice who can offer a wide range of perspectives on how Florida can benefit from Medicare for All. And we'll learn about how activists are building movement power from the ground up or from the mangrove up uh, to make Medicare for all a keystone issue in progressive politics. In tonight's webinar format, unfortunately, only uh, panelists can speak. Um, let me stop sharing for a sec. Unfortunately, only panelists can speak, but we do want you to interact with us. So please do put your names, pronouns, and where you're from in the chat, as well as what motivates you to support Medicare for All. Uh, and now to the thing that just brings us here today, which is the dismal state of Florida's healthcare system. More than 2.5 million Floridians do not have health insurance. In Florida, over 7% of children are uninsured. Of the total population, the uninsured rate is 
percent, which puts Florida in the top five states in the country. But even this statistic comes from 2021, which was before the mass Medicaid disenrollment that is going on right now. Just from April to July, over 418,000 Florida resident, residents were disenrolled from Medicaid. And again, the, these statistics that we're talking about, they only include uninsured as opposed to, you know, underinsured is not included. But, you know, while I say that, that is true. But at the same time, Floridians are resolved to work to transform our healthcare system. And that's what tonight's town hall is about. So let me kick things off with a quick overview of what Medicare for All means. So uh, just quick Medicare for All 101. Uh, these are there's a bill in the House of Representatives and a bill in the Senate. Uh, you're talking about a single payer as opposed to a multi-payer insurance system. That means who is paying the doctor's bill? It all comes from one source, one insurance, one national public insurance company, uh, or in one national public insurance program. Uh, it expands Medicare as it currently exists into a single public program with no fees, co-pays, or deductibles. It improves Medicare to cover vision, dental, hearing aids, long-term care, reproductive and gender-affirming care and abortion. And it also provides this health insurance to every person living in the United States as a basic human right, meaning that your health care will be tied to your immigration, your employment, or to your marital status. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to probably not now, but I will later put in a, a link to um, to a summary of the bill, a longer summary from the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, but before we get to our first speaker, let me introduce my co-host for tonight, Stefan Ramdor of Medicare for All Florida. Stefan, welcome. Yes, thank you so much, Brittany. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Stefan Ramdor, I'm pronouns he, him. I live in Daytona Beach, and I am the chair of the nonprofit organization Medicare for All Florida. So Medicare for All Florida started in 2021 as a grassroots group. Um, last year in 2022, Medicare for All Florida became a nonprofit. And um, we currently do have 11 board members. So at this point, I'd like to ask board members or advisory panel to introduce themselves in the chat with their name and where they are based out of. Um, Medicare for All Florida has monthly virtual meetings with presentations and guest speakers. Um, Medicare for All Florida activists have organized and worked in their communities, for example, to encourage cities to pass Medicare for All resolutions. Um, one of those passed in Gainesville, which we will hear more about later today. Medicare for All Florida has prioritized building relationships with activists and groups um, that are leading the fight for health justice at the local level, and that we'll hear from some of those actually tonight. So tonight's program shows that the movement for Medicare for All in Florida is blossoming. And also we will present a number of opportunities to get involved. So now I am delighted to introduce our first speaker, Patrick Haley. Patrick is a co-president of Students for National Health Program, the chapter at the University of Florida, originally from Port Lauderdale. Patrick is a three-year um, third year, excuse me, medical student and a future pediatrician. Patrick can tell us about why Medicare for All is strongly supported by medical students and new doctors. So welcome, Patrick. Thanks, Stefan. Appreciate it. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Haley. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a current third year medical student at the University of Florida and co-founder of the University of Florida's branch for Students of Our National Health Program, or SNAP. So um, my journey into single payer began um, right before medical school uh, during my gap year while I was working as a coordinator in a neurology clinic. Um, we had this patient come in for severe headaches and neurologic deficits, which are um, pretty common alarm signs for a brain tumor. So our attending physician, Dr. Stolk, uh, scheduled an MRI on site. And when she went to review the results to um, see if our patient had a brain tumor, she saw that the patient's insurance had denied coverage for the MRI. 
Um, the insurance agent with no medical training claimed that our patient had received an MRI too recently to be covered for another one and suggested that we wait for the next calendar year for more testing. Um, Dr. Stalk ended up calling the insurance company and stayed on the phone for two hours during clinic, waiting for a peer-to-peer -peer with a physician who wasn't even trained in neurology to argue that the patient needed a more extensive workup. After being forced to spend her time on the phone instead of caring for her patients, the insurance company finally relented, and the MRI did confirm Dr. Stolk's suspicions that our patient had a brain tumor, for which they were able to um, get a referral to neurosurgery and oncology at that visit. Um, that event highlighted to me not only the inadequacies of our current for-profit healthcare system, but also how the inadequacies are either passed on to the physician to compensate for or left to the patient to suffer from. If the for-profit uh, insurance companies got their way, our patient would be treating their headaches with Tylenol while the tumor in their brain grew because their insurance had deemed that further workup was unnecessary. I do not want to spend my medical career providing substandard care for my patients because insurance reps who never went to medical school are telling me what the next best steps are. This sentiment is, con com is common amongst my peers as everyone in training has a similar story to where the system failed both the provider and the patient. While it's disheartening for these stories to be so common, I have a lot of hope that these stories are highlighting the injustice in our current healthcare system to medical trainees. Medicare for All is extremely popular amongst medical students and becoming even more so. New chapters of Students for a National Health, a Health Program, or SNAP, have been established at the University of Florida, University of Miami, and Florida State University over the last year, which all share the common goal of uniting medical students in support of Medicare for All in Florida. With all your support, we hope to accomplish our goal of making Medicare for All a reality. Thank you for your time and efforts in this fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, yes, this is incredible to hear um, about all your work uh, at the SNAP chapter and, and of course, um, to becoming a, a pediatrician going forward. So um, yeah, Patrick, thank you for joining us and sharing with us. Um, so now um, I would like to bring in our next speaker. We have with us former state representative and state senator Dwight M. Bullard who has an impressive resume as a high school teacher, um, a state legislator, and now being the senior political advisor at Florida Rising. Throughout Dwight's career, he's shown a consistent dedication to empowering people and amplifying the voices of those who are often unheard. So I'm really looking forward to what he has to say about Medicare for All. Welcome, Dwight. Thank you, Stefan, for the invitation. Um, I'll be honest, my heart is heavy today. And uh, as many of you know, uh, we have three uh, individuals who are no longer with us in Jacksonville uh, who are murdered in an act of racialized violence. Now, the reason I bring that to this space today is because two points need to be crystallized. One is understanding the obstacles that we're up against in order, in order to gain a Medicare for all. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, the history of why we don't have a nationalized healthcare system in this country is rooted in anti-Black uh, sentiment. Uh, whether it was right after uh, the Civil War when it was first introduced, uh, part of the original concept when brought to uh, Ulysses S. Grant's administration at that time was that expansion or access to healthcare uh, would provide access for, for Black folks. And so therefore, if we wanted to eliminate, quote unquote, the Negro problem in this country, a nationalized healthcare system would not be the way to go. Fast forward to World War I and again in World War II, where uh, you had opportunities for the country to do uh, what was in the best interest of the people. And unfortunately, the will and desire weren't there again, rooted in uh, racialized anti-Blackness and discrimination. Um, now that brings me to the second point, which is the intersectional and interconnective nature of why Medicare for All is important and why we need to think about it in the broader context. So here at Florida Rising, we work on five kind of uh, different salient subject matters, uh, reproductive rights, housing justice, climate justice, criminal systems reform, and democracy expansion. The reason I bring that up is because when we think about all of those things, there's a deep interconnectivity between that and what we're talking about here today. Uh, when we think about reproductive rights and we think about in, in particular, uh, the abortion ballot initiative that, that is likely to be on the ballot just this year, 
we have to understand that what we have in that is an opportunity to drive home the point that we care about not only women's bodily autonomy, right, but cementing in our constitution here in the state, the need for medical access for all people. Why is that important? Because there's a very real opportunity in 2026 to do the same for Medicaid expansion here in the state of Florida. So we need both. It should not be a question of uh, either one. It should always be a question of both. And. Secondarily, when we think about criminal systems reform and housing justice in this moment, when we talk about the notion of individuals incarcerated not having access uh, to the medical necessities that they that they desire uh, means that we are marginalizing even further people uh, who are being subjugated uh, to a less than status in this in this country. We think about housing as a human right. And we think about houseless populations. And we think about folks that are struggling to pay uh, for their uh, medicines, for their prescriptions, uh, because they want to keep a roof over their head or keep their uh, insurance premiums uh, at some manageable level. We should not have to make that decision. When we think about climate and the impacts of climate on our, on our environment, that is a healthcare crisis that we're all dealing with on a consistent and everyday basis. But lastly, and I think most importantly though, when we think about the notion of voting rights, democracy expansion, and how we move forward in this, in this country, it's going to take each and every one of us uh, to make this point clear. I say this because it's critically important for us to understand that everything we're talking about here is interconnected. The work we do at Florida Rising is one that centers historically marginalized people putting them at the forefront, making them the, the, the owners, if you will, uh, of ultimately uh, being the change makers uh, in the world that we need. Lastly, I just wanna simply say that this isn't just an American problem. It is a global problem. When we think about the marginalization of people around the globe, whether that be Palestinians, whether that be people in Southeast Asia, or anywhere else, uh, or South America for that matter, this is something where we cannot as American citizens in this fight for our own uh, expansion, not lose sight of the fact that there are people globally and in our own country that are deserving of healthcare as a human right. And so I just want to remind us that while we're fighting, what we're fighting for, and that there are organizations like Florida Rising that really want to help in making sure that we have opportunity and access for everyone. Appreciate the opportunity. Wow, thank you so much for joining us today and for your leadership in fighting for a better Florida. It's been really wonderful having Florida Rising as a partner in this work. Uh, it's so important to emphasize the amazing work of activist leaders like you and like Rhonda, who I think is also in the chat and who spoke last year. You know, folks who have like really have this intense love for Florida, for Florida's people and who are doing that necessary work to build a political future that reflects that type of love. Uh, and that brings me to our next speaker, Dr. Armin Henderson. Dr. Henderson is the Director of Community Engagement at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. He is also the founder of Dade County Street Response, an initiative applying harm reduction and abolitionist principles, offering free year-round medical service through street medicine, urgent care, and disaster relief teams for Miami residents. Dr. Henderson, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, it's such a joy to be in conversation with people who are talking about radicalizing uh, Florida. Um, one of the things uh, that I think is important to mention, and I love, you know, going after Dwight, uh, uh, you know, Senator Bullard, because he always sets the floor historically. Um, when I first moved to Miami, uh, which was about 10 years ago, um, I was, uh, you know, I found out that you know, the state was being run by Rick Scott, who, you know, had the largest Medicare fraud scandal in United States history and, uh, you know, came from an organization called HCA, which is the largest employer of physicians and practices across the United States. And that's growing as well. Um, and, you know, this is a guy who decided that he was not going to expand Medicaid under the Obamacare Act. Um, and then his predecessor, of course, is, is who we have now. Um, 
but these are the forces that we're fighting up against. And this is why I thought that it was necessary really to step outside of the hospital doors and to connect uh, what uh, Senator Bullard was talking about, the social determinants of health, uh, those things that determine whether or not vulnerable populations live or die sometimes 10 to 15 years earlier than well-to-do populations, uh, regardless of whether or not they have health care. That interconnectedness, I think, is very important. And I'm very, very uh, elated that uh, Senator Bullard uh, elaborated on that. Um, but what I'm really here to talk about is, uh, is how ready I think medical professionals are uh, to join in on this fight. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, ACA is the largest, uh, you know, employer of, of physicians across the United States, which makes them workers, basically. And I think we found and saw that we were work workers like other working class individuals, probably a lot more higher paid, but still working class, when physicians found themselves wearing trash bags during COVID-19 and found themselves overworked and, and still find themselves in the same predicament uh, today. Uh, as they're being employed by corporations similar uh, to HCA and other corporations across the United States. So I, I think I think uh, physicians are ready, medical professionals are definitely ready. And Dade County Street Response, it, it puts social determinants of health in action. What we do is we provide free programming uh, for individuals in uh, vulnerable communities uh, across Miami um, through things like, you know, the urgent care, the street medicine team, the disaster relief team, in hopes that, you know, these students they find themselves as case managers for these vulnerable populations and bumping their heads you know, on walls, trying to understand how people who can have insurance still face all these loopholes to get the things that they need. Um, a lot of times we just come out of our pocket and just pay for things through our nonprofit. Um, but I think through the process of, of doing those things, medical students become radicalized and are asking critical questions like, why don't we have Medicare for all? Um, why why don't people have access to the social determinants of health? Why are our budgets, local, state, and federal budgets so filled with you know policing and prisons? And I think once we start to have those conversations, that you know students become ready to step up. Um, and so a lot of what we do is 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 to radicalize medical students and medical professionals in, into becoming advocates. And so yes, Medicare for all is the first step. I think it is the first step amongst a radical thing revision of, of what we have to do in Florida. And I look forward to taking that first, first step and moving forward past that as well. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much for joining us and just sharing the work you're doing, you know, and the leadership that mm -hmm. it's showing not just in Florida, but to the rest of the country. Um, and I really hope that folks are getting, you know, warmed up out here and seeing like, there's so much great work that is going on in Florida right now. Uh, I am thrilled to have the honor of introducing the star speaker of the evening. Uh, I had the privilege of attending the press conference for the reintroduction of the House Medicare for All bill this spring. And I can confidently say that Representative Maxwell Frost and his words to the crowd had a big impact on everybody. There were tears, there were old season activists coming up to me afterwards to say, wow, this reminds me of why I got involved in this, in the, in this fight in the first place. And so when it came to the idea of putting on a second Medicare for All Florida town hall, we knew exactly who we wanted to be our headliner. Uh, after working in leadership roles at ACLU and March for Our Lives, Maxwell Frost became the first Gen Z member of Congress. He's a staunch ally on Medicare for All, and if he's Gen Z, maybe he's got some Crocs on. So uh, welcome, Representative Maxwell Frost. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and it's such a blessing and privilege to be in this space with so many amazing activists. I wouldn't say I'm the star speaker uh, because there's so many speakers who just went before me and that are going to go after me. But I am a speaker. And that's an honor in and of itself. And I appreciate all the work everyone's doing. And like it was mentioned, and it, well, for people who don't know me, I'm Congressman Maxwell Alejandro Frost. I proudly represent Florida's 10th congressional district, which is central Florida. Um, today, you know, we've been prepping for the hurricane. So uh, and so for folks in Florida, I'm assuming everyone's in Florida, make sure you're prepared um, for the storm tomorrow evening. Um, and just thank you to everyone for the work that you do. You know, um, I come from organizing. I've been organizing since I was 15 years old. And, you know, for a long time, I, I think about the way I got to a lot of my policy positions. And a lot of it was based in the campaigns I worked on. 
And I one of the one of the campaigns I worked years ago was for this very old guy who traveled the country. He ran for president and he really, um, I think, sparked uh, a movement in this country and changed politics forever. And one, um, and his name is Bernie Sanders. And one of his um, top issues were was Medicare for all. That was my first time learning about it and becoming so deeply invested in it. And when I think about my goals as an elected official, the simplest way to put it is I'm in the fight for guarantees. What do I mean by that? Well, our country provides many guarantees right now. Um, working people and all people have a guarantee to public education. They don't guarantee that your school will be properly funded, but they guarantee you can go. Corporations, oil companies are guaranteed subsidies um, no matter how much they're harming our environment and uh, no, ma no matter how much they're messing up our climate. There are many of these guarantees that are given to corporations. And there's a movement of us, not just in Congress, but across the country and organizers that want to talk about guarantees for humans, for human resiliency and for working people. The guarantee that you can live free of gun violence, the guarantee that you can live free of hate crimes and of bigotry. Um, and Senator Bullard brought it up that three people were just lynched, killed in Jacksonville because they were black and they were hunted down. We live uh, a guarantee that all people can have housing as a human right, a guarantee that you can have a job, a federal jobs guarantee, a guarantee that, yes, you can have health care. And we ask this question, why? And we don't have a health care system in this country right now. We have a sickness care system in this country, a system that values profits over human lives. And we see this problem in many different issues. In gun violence, where the gun lobby and gun sales trump our children and trump people's lives on a daily basis. We see it with the climate crisis, where the sales and the profits of oil companies and energy companies mean more than the health and resiliency of our planet and of our species. And if anything, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us just how cruel and irrational personal and employer-based healthcare uh, private insurance is. That's leaving millions of newly unemployed Americans without care when they need it the most. And I, I wanna hone in on one word I said, because I think all of us on this call agree that it's the moral and right thing to do to provide healthcare for everybody. But unfortunately, not everybody in this country is pulled by what's the right thing to do for humanity. So I want to talk about the how irrational this system is, because when you people have health care, when people don't have to worry about going to the doctor and going broke and paying their rent and paying for their medicine, guess what? People are happier in this country. People there will be more productivity in this country. There will be less crime in this country. All of these issues are connected. So if you care about the economy and you care about human resiliency and you care about people being productive and you care about crime, every issue you care about can boil down to the material conditions of our people. And one of the most important material conditions are whether or not you're healthy or not. Americans get sicker, die younger, and pay more for their health care than other countries um, in this world. And to ensure that every person in America has comprehensive health care with no co-pays, premiums, or deductions means we must abolish the illness care system. And that's what we have right now. And we have people in Congress that want to get rid of Medicare as it is. Um, and so just to talk about two things really quick, we're fighting to protect Medicare as it is and fighting to have Medicare for all because that's what we deserve as a people. I just introduced a bill. Um a few months ago called the Safe Through Medicare Act, which I'm really excited about. It, ha it has the intersections of the climate crisis, taking care of our seniors and protecting Medicare and expanding it. And what it does is direct Medicare to cover 100% of the cost for external battery systems for and cooling systems for our seniors. And for people who don't know, in this state, when the power goes out during a hurricane, the people who are most likely to die are seniors, people who are 65 plus. And do you know how they die? They suffocate or they die because the power was off and their machines couldn't work or the insulin couldn't be kept cool.
And something that's important to me is finding out what are the niche things we can do to save lives and show people that government can work for everybody and can work for people. So we introduced a, a safe through Medicare Act. So when the power goes out, Medicare can cover external battery systems, cooling systems for seniors. So the dialysis, oxygen, BiPAP machines, and insulin um, can be kept safe when the power goes out. I call that human resiliency. And so we're really excited about the Safe Through Medicare Act. I wanted to tell you all about that. It's something I introduced in the House and my, uh, uh, my partner in the Senate is Senator Ed Markey, um, who is the champion of the Green New Deal in the Senate. Not just that, but we also have to get rid of one of the greatest scams that exists in the government, Medicare Advantage. The, the attempt, not just attempt, they're, they're becoming successful in this, trying to privatize Medicare. And don't let the word Medicare and Medicare Advantage fool you. It's not Medicare. It is incredi it's, it's incredibly lucrative for HMOs that are completely scamming the government out of money by the government paying a lump sum every year for see each senior, and then the HMO turning around, giving poor service, spending way less than what we gave them, and doing it every year. And guess what? The Medicare Advantage signup rates are through the roof in Florida and through the roof in places across this entire country. So I hope, you know, as we fight for Medicare for all, we also have to fight to get rid of Medicare Advantage. They'll throw in a gym membership and a fancy phone and people will think it's a really good healthcare plan, but it's not. It's a scam and it's meant to privatize Medicare and we can't have that. Why do I support Medicare for all? Because it's popular. Why do I set Medicare for, uh, uh, why do I for Medicare for all? Because it's the quickest way to universal healthcare. And I always like to tell people this, I'm for universal healthcare. I didn't just say, yeah, Medicare for all, just because Bernie did it or just because, you know, as a movement, progressives talk about it. I looked into all of the plans people have to get to universal health care, and there's a bunch of them out there, and some of them are good, but Medicare for all is the best one by far. And when people come up to me and they talk about being practical, Medic what is more practical than taking an already existing program? That's incredibly popular and simply expanding it and making it better. I don't know about you, but I feel like moderates should be all over this because that sounds super practical to me. It's something that already exists. And again, Medicare for all isn't just about expanding Medicare to, for, to everybody, but it's about improving Medicare and ensuring that it covers you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. This is a winning issue if all you think about is politics. This is a winning issue if all you think about is policy. And this is a winning issue if what you want is for the best for our people. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, and I'll end with this, it's about a question that I think we should ask of every politician. How much do you love your people? Because I don't know about y'all, but when I love somebody, I want them to be healthy. And so as politicians, as leaders, a vote for Medicare for all is a vote of love and confidence in our people. And one less issue we have to fight for. So I'm in this fight with y'all. I'm proud to be one of the original co-sponsors of the reintroduction of Medicare for all. Like it was said, um, I spoke at the press conference alongside Senator Bernie Sanders and Pramila Jayapal. And you know what? That press conference didn't just have the most progressive members in Congress. And that honestly gave me so much hope. There were uh, very centrist members of Congress at that press conference who have signed on. And to people who think we're very far away from Medicare for all, it has over 100 co-sponsors, over half the Democratic caucus is on that bill. And we can and we will win Medicare for all. So again, y'all, thank you for your work. It's not going to be one politician or just politicians that get us this. It's going to be everybody putting pressure on folks. Um, and I know we'll get it. So here with y'all, much love. Thank you so much for all the work you do, Medicare for All, Florida, and all the amazing organizations. That flyer, when I got sent the flyer and there was like a million organizations on there, I was like, let's go. <laughs> you know, that was great to see because that infrastructure exists in the state. So thank you all so much. Much love and have a great day.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Maxwell Frost. Um, this was incredible. Um, yes, you, you really summed it up perfectly. Um, Medicare for all, what it is, why we need it. And thank you so much for all of your work, um, like also on the bill to expand Medicare for the seniors with battery systems. Um, yes, thank you so much for everything you do. We're honored that you joined us tonight. So um, yes, uh, we do want to talk also, just like um, the representative mentioned about ways to get involved. So um, we're going to hear more about that in a minute. Um, just to tease like two items here um, that Medicare for All Florida has coming up. Um, join us, for example, at the Orlando Come Out with Pride, which is going to be on October 21st for the table put on by Medicare for All Florida together with PDA, P4DA. So Orlando Come Out with Pride, um, incredible. Um, join us or, of course, on September 20th. That's the next time for our Medicare for All Florida monthly meeting. Um, we are delighted to be having the opportunity to welcome two inspiring candidates, uh, Carmen Torres and Anthony Nieves, as well as Rose Roach with the labor campaign for a single payer. So um, you'll hear more about this and other opportunities um, shortly uh, from Brittany. And uh, yeah, Brittany, I'm going to turn it back over to you now. Brittany, hi again. All right. Let me... Uh... Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit, just a little bit, about the work that I do with Public Citizen, where I collaborate with activist groups from Life Medicare for All Florida to pass resolutions in support of Medicare for All. So um, let me share my screen. Got some slides, and I like to think it's fun, um, but hopefully you'll think it's half as much fun as I do. Um, so. Uh, there are some, uh, there's a little hint of some threatened and endangered species that are native to Florida in my presentation, and I will explain that in a moment. Um, so uh, the, the Medicare for All Resolutions campaign, like this is the map of the uh, resolutions we've passed in Florida. So uh, most recently Gainesville, uh, before that Key West, Tampa, and St. Petersburg. Tampa and St. Petersburg were led by uh, Progressive Democrats of America. Uh, and uh, uh, so there was uh, Kristen Hoffman and uh, with uh, uh, Mike Fox did a lot of work on that. And then uh, Medicare for All Florida didn't quite exist yet then, but then they got together and they passed these two resolutions last year. Uh, so the reason why we do resolutions is that, you know, Local government is more accessible to people than who are at the margins of our broken health care system. If you talk to someone who's, who's, who's struggling and you tell them to call their congressperson, they might not be, their response to you might not be very nice um, because, you know, it, it, it sounds patronizing. Um, it, but local governments do feel more accessible to everybody. And, you know, employee health care plans are a major drain on municipal budgets. It would save them money. And we have been able to build this model, uh, this organizing model that is focused on legislative advocacy and leadership development. So we work with people who have maybe never organized anything before. Uh, we've helped them put together a campaign. And this sort of helps to uh, test the limits of the, the normal distributed organizing model. It's a staff of two people. Now it's just a staff of one. <laughs> Uh, who works on this, the public citizen, just me. So we have a comprehensive toolkit uh, with sample resolutions, meeting agendas, step-by-step -step advice. Um, you know, winning resolutions, it sustains social movement energy and reminds activists that Medicare for All is achievable. Because this is the thing with organizing is you really need wins. You need wins to feel like you are winning. If it's just a bunch of, you know, you're struggling and you're struggling and you're struggling, there are no wins in between you're gonna burn out. But, um, and so this is, oh, I have the old bill number in here, but the activists in districts belonging to the Democrats in Congress who haven't signed on to the bill can bring these resolutions with them to their lobby meetings. So, um, and city council members and county commissioners do go on to run for state and federal office. So we have this, uh, one of the other speakers at the uh, Medicare for All bill launch was uh, Representative uh, Garcia, who uh, was uh, who who led a resolution effort as the mayor of Long Beach uh, in California? So um, 
let me uh, just a quick showing of um, the uh, so you can know which of the members of Congress in Florida support Medicare for all. Um, there's our list of co-sponsors. Uh, you know, the folks who have not yet co-sponsored on the Democratic side are Darren Soto, Kathy Castor, Jared Moskowitz, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Um, and so those are folks, you know, it, it is something to look at this and realize that half of Florida's Democrats are on the bill. And uh, I, I'm in, I live in Maryland, and uh, I think ours is about, our situation is about the same. So, um, you know, there is a lot going on here. There's more that can be done. Um, you know, Republicans aren't on the bill either. Uh, we haven't gotten them on the bill in any state yet, but maybe, yeah, never say never. So um, let me, uh, so let me uh, move quickly to our next speaker to talk a little bit about the resolutions process. So um, Candy Birch is a board member for Medicare for All Florida. She played a, uh, a pivotal role in the passage of a Medicare for All resolution in Gainesville. And Candy's gonna take a couple minutes to recap what it's like to jump into a resolution effort and how it feels to win. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the idea that I, I get to speak to this uh, to this issue. I have to tell you that back in uh, twenty uh, October of twenty twenty two, we um, well as a result of working with public citizen and um, and the Alachua County uh, Labor Coalition, we did some work ahead of time, but on in October of 2022, we made a presentation to the, the uh, Gainesville City, Count, uh, City Commission. And it was, it was kind of a neat deal because we had spent the summer um, uh, collecting like 300 signatures from Gainesvillians at different places who, who said that they supported universal health care. And then we had a member of the commission who was also uh, um, supportive. Her name was Raina Sacco. And she brought that resolution forward to our commission. And so we were given 10 minutes to make this presentation, as you might be able to see in that in that slide there. And so we did. There's a video of it. And, and uh, I don't you know, it, it's there. And that's what I like about those videos is that people who don't necessarily attend the those commission meetings in person have the opportunity to see what is what we were saying. In the slide that you see there, we're speaking to the commission. Um, um, the Labor Coalition leader, Gaby Gross, presented what Medicare for All would entail, and then I presented uh, the rationale for advocating, and those are kind of like those, all of those facts that Brittany gave us earlier on, but they were really, uh, they were really uh, honed in to to Alachua County and Gainesville. So we had those there. And so what was neat about that, and the next slide will tell you what I'm talking about, um, uh, Brittany. The next slide, I believe, is so uh, significant. So can you show that for me, Brittany? Well, Okay, well, no matter what, the, the next slide is actually this list of all of the Medicare for all resolutions that have been done so far. So right before we came on, Atlanta, the Atlanta City Commission had a, a passed a resolution uh, for Medicare for all. And then when we made our presentation, the City Commission of Gainesville um, passed it unanimously. And that's so significant because resolutions, as Brittany says, are the very definition of grassroots. And that back in October told me that we had an opportunity to join 100 more people. Since then, there are 123. I'm so excited about that. I am so also excited that we joined St. Petersburg, Key West, and Tampa. And I really, really, really am energized now to see what else we can do. What other, uh, what other city commissions and county commissions can we go? And we would love all of you to help us make this happen. Thank you so much, Brittany. Thank you, Candy. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad that you were able to make it. I know that uh, <laughs> you're expecting some rough weather out there. Um, so let me sort of get to the, uh, the reason 
uh, why you may have seen some random animals. Because we are getting to the interactive part of the event. Um, let's bring it out. So we have some events coming up because it's wonderful that all of you all have come out to join this event for Medicare for All. But the folks at Medicare for All Florida, which really built itself uh, up last year on the you know after we had a similar webinar, uh, they really want you to join them at one of these upcoming events. So I'm going to make this pitch. And if you are just with the first name, if you could also say who you are in the chat, like where, what town you live in, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, name one of these uh, wonderful endangered creatures. Uh, and then the folks who uh, want to join this meeting, you're going to just RSVP by just, just commenting in the, in the chat. And then I'm going to get in touch with you. So if you just have your first name, just say, Oh yeah, I'm Jim, but I live in uh, in Boca or something like that. So the first one, uh, well, it's actually the last one, but we're going last to first. So we have the the Florida salt marsh vole is uh, a, a a very rare uh, rare uh, rodent to encounter, but very sweet looking. Uh, and uh, like the uh, Florida salt marsh vole, the uh, Medicare for All Florida monthly meeting with Rose Roach of the Labor for Single Payer campaign is a rare opportunity because uh, Rose is really a, just an amazing speaker. She also has worked on a lot of resolutions in Minnesota. Um, she knows so much about this movement. And if you have any questions about how to get your union involved more or what you can do to build union support in this movement, she's just such an excellent person to speak to. So if you are feeling uh, like you want to just dig yourself a little hole so you can watch Rose speak with the uh, Medicare for All Florida monthly meeting, uh, please just uh, let us know in the chat. Just say, uh, I'm a salt marsh bull. Uh, so the next one we have is uh, we're going to be doing a legislative strategy call on uh, when, two weeks from now on Wednesday, September 13th at 7 p.m. So this is, we're trying to get groups of people together to um, strategize around some of these districts that I showed earlier. Um, the four Democrats who are not on board, um, you know, there's some specific interest in Representative Soto and Representative Moskowitz. So especially if you're in those districts, but also if you're not, if you, feel like a Florida gopher frog and you want to sing and sing and sing until these legislators sign on to this bill, please say, I'm a Florida gopher frog in the chat. And finally, uh, the um, I have the uh, Florida's charismatic, well, one of many of Florida's charismatic megafauna, the uh, Florida black bear here. Uh, just like the black bear is a keystone species of the ecosystem who shapes uh, the ecological processes that exist around, uh, around him. Uh, you, if you were working on a Medicare for All resolution, really boosts the, um, the activity and the existence of the Medicare for All movement in your town, in your county. And so if you are interested in, in doing what Candy did and being a Florida black bear, just like Candy, then uh, you uh, just type in uh, Florida black bear in the chat. I'm a Florida black bear. Um, that's the other thing about the Florida black bear is that they're actually rising in number um, and just people don't always see that they're there, but that doesn't mean that you're not doing important work. So again, the Salt Marsh Malt Bowl is the next Medicare for All Florida monthly meeting with Rose Roach. So type, say something in the chat if that's you. Uh, if you want to join this legislative strategy call uh, on uh, September 13th, tell us you're a Florida gopher frog, uh, especially if you like to make some noise. And if you are ready to scavenge through the uh, city budgets and, uh, you know, uh, just be a, be, be, make yourself very um, visible, very visible to your local council. 
please uh, say I'm a Florida black bear in the chat. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let me, uh, so that's that. Uh, I um, Now I'm just excited to bring in uh, Carolina Wasmer. Carolina is the Florida State Program Director for Poder Latinx in uh, Orlando. She has a strong background in community advocacy and organizing. I'm thrilled to welcome, here, welcome her and hear what she has to say. Carolina, the mic's yours. Thank you. And thanks everybody who has spoken today. It was really, you know, great information and very inspired um, to listen to everyone and for us to, to be in this space together. So Poder Latinx is an organization that works on social justice, social and civic justice for the Hispanic community. We work on immigration justice as well as economic justice and environmental justice. And I liked your spinoff here with the environmental and the Medicaid for all. So uh, um, we also, um, in our work, we make sure that, you know, we are also working on the paid leave campaign and our economic justice and on the IRA when it comes to environmental justice. We know that one in five in Florida Latinos, um, one in five Floridians are, you know, Latinos. And that represents about 57% um, nationally. Um, we know that about 25% of Latinos are affected for being either underinsured or uninsured. We know that a lot of time the Latinx community um, has a lot of jobs that we learned in COVID are very important to maintain um, our economy strong. Um, for this reason, you know, Latinos make up a high density population that works really strong to make sure that Florida um, continues to thrive. And we believe that, you know, it isn't fair that, you know, Florida has the fifth largest death rates when it comes to uninsured um, and that we really need to make sure that we are making an impact. Uh, climate change and the increase in, in our weather isn't normal as we are facing a hurricane right now and the waters are very warm. Um, this is definitely, you know, something that people with asthma and we know that Latinos are the highest population for asthma as well as um, um I want to say, um, my apologies, hypertension is the word that wasn't coming out. Um, so we know that the Latino community suffers from a lot of different healthcare, um, you know, issues and chronic issues. And for this reason, we believe, and as Maxwell Frost has said it, our community really needs a strong Medicaid for all program and a program that really provides healthcare for everybody. Um, the co-payments and the difficulty, even no matter the status um, of our loved one as well. We know that we're facing many immigration barriers as well in the state of Florida. And the fact that, um, you know, we're all here for a better opportunity for our friends and family. And we believe that this is a, you know, a program that we can support and make sure that we're all working together. So we thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carolina, for joining us and just filling us in on the work you're doing. I'm glad you appreciated my bioregionally regionally specific and appropriate references. I hope all the, the furry animals and, and, and frogs and everything are going to be okay with the weather coming. But thank you so much uh, and for your help in co-sponsoring this event. Uh, so our final speaker, uh, Dr. Irving Binger, uh, is definitely like a last but not least because Dr. Binger, you know, folks have asked, what about a state Medicare for all bill? You know, has anyone ever thought about trying that in Florida? Well, I think that Dr. Binger can speak to that history. Um, and uh, yeah, so welcome, welcome Dr. Binger. Thank you, Brittany. Hi. Can you see me? Yes, we can see and hear you loud and clear. Okay, so uh, as Brittany said, I'm Dr. Irving Binger. I'm a family physician. I was born in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, graduated from McGill University in Montreal. Um, and I practiced in the single payer healthcare system in the province of Ontario, Canada, and then came to the United States, to the University of Miami Department of Family Medicine, and practiced in a non-healthcare system. 
because even in 1976, we had no healthcare system. We still have no healthcare system. It's not a system. It's a disorganized uh, opportunity for profit, for greed, for throwing away healthcare dollars that should go to provide for the actual health care of people. So um, in 1988, long time ago, we started a organization called the Florida Healthcare Campaign. There were no fees, there were no membership fees. There were uh, a loose group of people who met regularly in Orlando. Some of the Actually, most of the organizations that Brittany showed us at the beginning of this town hall, which has been exciting and, and wonderful, and it's good to see all you young people actually doing things that uh, we used to do and uh, I'm looking forward to doing again. Um, so those organizations worked and in working with the uh, all uh, I was going to say all the stars were aligned in 1992. We had a Democratic, a Democrat House, and a Democrat Senate, and a Democrat Governor in the state of Florida. From 1988 to 92, people, organizations, single advocates, senior advocates, people all across the 67 counties of Florida got together and started to talk to all of their legislators, Republicans, Democrats, et cetera. We had House Bill 1 sponsored by Elaine Gordon, the chairman of the healthcare committee at that time in 92 and sponsored in the Senate by Eleanor Weinstock from West Palm Beach the chairman of the HRS committee in the Senate. With the help of all different organizations, unions, uh, labor, et cetera, in addition, Republicans from all corners of this state, they weren't in the majority then, they were in a big minority, but they, having been talked with by their constituents who were all advocates for single payer healthcare, a publicly financed system, state administered, no insurance premiums, no uh, deductibles, no other payments. You had your choice of healthcare provider, Healthcare providers were private entrepreneurs. We had competition in the system and everybody in Florida, all residents of Florida would have full access to inpatient care, outpatient care, um, nursing home care, custodial and residential, uh, prescription medications, every other part, dental services, all pay for by the single payer, which was the state of Florida. No insurance companies anymore. No insurance companies providing insurance for healthcare. That's what a single payer means. That's what a single payer does. And it provides for all of the things that Senator Buller talked about, Patrick Haley talked about, uh, Maxwell Congressman Frost talked about, when you provide health care as a right and an opportunity for easy access to people, then people who now are being left out, not only because they don't have insurance, or that they're underinsured, but because they actually don't live in a place where they have access to health care. So a child who lives in Homestead 
who has an ear infection in the middle of the night and has to be taken to Jackson Memorial Hospital in downtown Miami, that's not going to happen. That child, instead of getting proper health care on an acute basis, immediate access, and having their otitis media taken care of, that doesn't happen. They end up with complications, severe infection, possible hearing loss, and as you may imagine, even worse. Those things don't have to happen. They don't happen in all the industrialized countries of our, of our world. They don't happen. We are the only one, the only industrialized country that does not have universal single-payer health care. Now, you've talked to a lot of people, I'm sure. You've had presentations. When we talk to people, and I did a lot of presentations during those four years, people would say to me, Irving, you're talking, you're preaching to the choir. And I would say, well, sir, ma'am, it's time that the choir started to sing. The choir needs to sing. Individual people in communities, you're doing it with the commissions. We need to do it right at the local levels. People joining our organizations, becoming singers of health care for all. Thank you very much for being here and listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Winger, for rounding this out and just sharing this history with everyone. And, you know, again, this is just showing like how much of leadership there is that there has been in Florida. And, you know, the like the that we are, as they say, we're standing on the shoulders of giants and the work that people have done before us. Right. So thank you so much for coming and helping us round out our program. I'm going to share my screen one last time uh with uh my little friends uh just in case you is it sharing the right one i think it is uh just just in case so uh if you are ready to join the uh, medicare for all florida's meeting coming up put in the uh that you are a salt marsh bull um they are really cute and then if you are ready to help out with this singing, you know, singing and singing and singing with uh, legislators to get them on the bill, uh, and you haven't said so yet, let us know that you're a Florida gopher, gopher frog. And then if you wanna be the cornerstone species in your community and help organize from the ground up uh, Medicare for all uh, movement, grassroots movement in your community through a resolution, then put in that you are, feeling like a black bear. Um, so I will thank you so much on behalf of Public Citizen. I'm going to turn it over to Stefan for any final remarks. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining tonight. Thank you for all of um, our incredible panelists. Um, this is great. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to speak to us. And um, yes, let's continue um, this fight um, the fight for Medicare for all in Florida. If we're organizing, if we um, stay together, if we stay diligent, um, people power, uh, we can win this. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night.